repeatedly punched yourself in the genitals on public transportation? I have. It was late December and I was feeling Christmas horny. You know Christmas horny? Oh, if you don't celebrate Christmas, Christmas horny is the kind of intense sexual arousal you can only reach by spending quality time with your family. <laughs> Just that, oh my God, I would fuck anyone to get out of this house right now. <laughs> I would get railed by anyone in any position. <laughs> just to sidestep this intergenerational trauma for five fucking minutes. Dad's Christmas horny. It had been a strange Christmas because earlier in the year, we lost my uncle. We found him again. <laughs> but he was dead. <laughs> it was a tune! which is the Comedian's Monday. Not to be confused with Wednesday, which is the Alcoholic's Friday. <laughs> and of course, not mentioning Sunday, because that's the Lord's Day. Not to be confused with the day of our Lord, which is of course when Jesus Christ will return to earth to redeem his faithful believers while banishing all unbelievers to the torture and despair of eternal damnation, because Jesus can be a bit of a cunt like that. I'd been to the grocery store to purchase some groceries and I was musing on the origin of the word grocer and how it was originally used to describe a place which sold items in bulk or gross amounts and how that evolved and changed over the years to now where it's the place itself that's fucking gross. <laughs> I think it's the distance between cause and effect I find most depressing at the supermarket. Every oak tree turned toilet paper. Every shark turned fish finger. Every art degree graduate turned shelf stacker. <laughs> 10,000 years of agricultural innovation reduced to a rickety trolley full of food-shaped science experiments and a clean-up in aisle four. <laughs> Always piss in aisle four. It's a security camera blind spot. <laughs> and that distance between cause and effect is still there when you get home from the supermarket. The deportation fearing farm worker inhaling pesticides for three bucks an hour just so you can leave a tomato congealing in your crisper for long enough for it to figure out how to clamber out and call the cops. My crisper's fucked up, man. It's primordial in my crisper. I recently sold the rights to my crisper to the BBC. <laughs> David Attenborough is filming in my fridge as we speak. <laughs> and if I were a lesser man, I would probably do a David Attenborough impersonation at this point of the show, but it's a slippery fucking slope. Before you know it, I'll be sitting on a couch across from Graham Norton, <laughs> awkwardly sweating my way through my best Matthew McConaughey or Owen Wilson impersonation, longing for the days when all you needed to make it in comedy was a loud shirt and a versatile pair of eyebrows. <laughs> I have neither! And I don't trust the variety in the supermarket. Too many fucking things. All of those specialty stores bulldozed for the soulless convenience of a one-stop shop. I recall as a child, every product had its very own shop. There was the fucking... Fruit Loop Shop. <laughs> Fucking... Fro 
frozen pea shop? <laughs> that was, of course, before the frozen pea man was arrested for selling his own chilled urine to the public. <laughs> frozen pea? Actual pea that's been frozen? OK, listen, Melbourne. No. <laughs> Look, you're not going to get a frozen urine joke of that calibre anywhere within the Greater Melbourne region on a Friday night. That joke's worth the price of admission. And what I'm sensing tonight, Melbourne, is you don't fucking deserve that joke! My point is... I find it inherently unnatural stocking items at extreme opposite ends of the good spectrum side by side in the one place. Did we learn nothing from the wet market? It's disgusting. But I needed a nine volt battery, a tin of shortbread biscuits, a bag of mandarins and a coat hanger. So what am I going to do? <laughs> I'm not making multiple stops. Do I look like a postman? <laughs> Don't answer that. I do look a little bit like a postman. <laughs> In case you're wondering, I used neither trolley nor basket because I prefer carrying too many things. <laughs> If there are things to be carried, <laughs> I'll fucking carry them. But there must be too many of them, and I wish to carry them all at once. I want to cut off my circulation. I would like to dislocate several of my fingers. There better be a fucking staircase involved. <laughs> and when I reach my destination, I want to drag those items across the threshold like I'm a field medic in a World War II film. <laughs> Stay with me, goddammit! I ain't losing you now, goddamn you! We gotta get you home to Bessie Lou! Oh no, goddamn it's over swim up! Over swim up! So I'm at the self-checkout. <laughs> I always use the self-checkout when I'm at the supermarket. You know how at the supermarket now you can poop your own shit? <laughs> you know how they let you do your own fucking poop? So, sorry, I was just having a flashback to a joke I wrote in 2009. That was weird. <laughs> Did you see that? What was that? <laughs> so I'm at the self-checkout and, um... I pretend to scan my goods and I pretend to pay for them and I go out on the street. <laughs> and I make my way to the bus stop. Now, I don't oft catch bus, but at the time this story occurs, I was driving a 2000 model 93S convertible Saab. Yeah, pretty sweet ride. <laughs> Would have sent you back about $40,000 in the year 2000. My dad bought one for two grand in 2016, spent $400 fixing it up, and now I, at the age of 43, borrow it when I'm in Melbourne between international tours. <laughs> international tours which are going so well that when I'm in Melbourne between international tours, I borrow my dad's 2000 model 93S convertible Saab. <laughs> oh. Yes. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes. Yes. Yes, thanks. The, the, the Saab is clearly not the only thing depreciating in value. <laughs> it's so much fun to drive around in the Saab with the top down when you have a passenger. As soon as the passenger gets out, you turn into an instant fucking douchebag. Because it's no longer an opportunistic parental car loan situation with a nifty soft top bonus feature. It's a 43-year-old making a conscious choice to drive around in a 2000 model 93S convertible Saab just barebacking the open air for all to see, taking a detour past the nearest grassy knoll in the hopes someone will blow my fucking head off. On this particular day, I have locked my keys in the car. <laughs> it is not the first time I have done this. <laughs> I've already poked a small hole in the soft top for easy coat hanger access. <laughs> Hence the coat hanger purchase! 
So I get to the bus stop and I sit down on the bench and I inadvertently knock an empty can of Coke off the end of the bench and it lands on the ground and a couple of European wasps crawl out of it looking for something to kill. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of the European wasp. First introduced to Australia in 1959, they aggressively took over the landscape, taking more than their fair share and steamrolling anyone who got in their way. Sound familiar? <laughs> yes, they're exactly like Spotify. <laughs> There's something very humbling about a bee sting killing the bee. The barb of her stinger lodging in her enemy and then disemboweling her as she pulls away. Humble, yet graphically violent. If taken literally, it puts a whole new spin on the Muhammad Ali philosophy, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, doesn't it? By that logic, he'd throw one punch and then shit his intestines out all over the ring. <laughs> Wasps, on the other hand, just keep stinging. Thrusting away like a... like some sort of... When I was writing this bit, <laughs> I never thought it would devolve into me just thrusting and one person going, a yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm glad it got there, but... <laughs> you know, I, originally when I wrote it, I couldn't actually think of an appropriate thruster to be thrusting in this imaginary thrust scenario that I'd created. So I literally Googled the word thrusting, <laughs> and the first thing that actually comes up is the definition, which is the motion of pushing or lunging suddenly or violently. <laughs> <laughs> but the second thing that came up was an article from askmen.com. <laughs> from the 22nd of November, 2022, entitled Thrusting Techniques. <laughs> Can using different thrusting techniques turn you into a better lover? I'll save you the read. The answer is not really. <laughs> and I quote from the article, no amount of memorizing and applying different thrusting techniques can equal the importance of talking to your partner about what they want in bed. <clears throat> oh yes, it's quite an elaborate description of the word consent, isn't it? <laughs> but no amount of memorizing. Memorizing! Look, this is a safe space. Melbourne, just by round of applause, who here is currently memorizing thrusting techniques? Anybody? Anybody at all? Oh, fuck that. People don't usually clap. I have so many questions. Are you practicing in front of a mirror? Or is there like a Duolingo style app that you have to use? 15 minutes a day and now I'm fluent in conversational thrusting. <laughs> or do you have to learn it like dance choreography? Five, six, seven, and thrust, and thrust, and woo, woo, woo. 
I wouldn't be any good at it, man. I was never good at memorizing information for exams when I was at school. I used to cheat and write the answers on the back of my hand. So in this scenario, I'd be there in bed looking at the back of my hand. So, okay, push or lunge, suddenly or violently. Doesn't seem right. Okay. <laughs> this is the rest of the show, by the way. So I'm at the bus stop. <laughs> and I am alone at the bus stop, but I know people will come. And I know in my heart that they will be odd people. <laughs> because every bus stop in the world is the opening scene in an independent short film. <laughs> it's just the way the universe works. Every time I am at a bus stop, there are weird characters there with me, and I can see the camera angles. I can see the script. I can see the disappointed parents who thought filmmaking was just a phase. <laughs> Until one day their child asks if they can borrow the 2000 model 93S convertible Saab. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm sitting at the bus stop waiting for principal photography to commence on this independent short film. And over to my right, I hear somebody scream, Walking Man! <laughs> I look over, and standing in the middle of the intersection is a white man, looks to be in his early 30s, top half, crisp white button-up shirt, blue tie, Bottom half, jogging shorts, Crocs, with the Japanese tiger tattooed on each calf muscle. And I was like, ha 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 ha, roll camera! <laughs> there was a car trying to turn left into the intersection, and he's walking alongside the car, pointing up at the traffic lights, going, walking man! Walking man! Walking man! Walking man! The driver of the car is an elderly Asian woman, and at first I think, oh, maybe his aggression is racially motivated. But it can't be that, because his calf muscles are so racially diverse. <laughs> he bangs on the bonnet. She manages to drive around him and take off down the street, and he chases after the car, screaming expletives, and then comes and sits next to me on the bench. <laughs> He smells of microbreweries and cryptocurrency. <laughs> he takes out an enormous vape pen and starts vaping. If you used to smoke cigarettes and now you vape, you're a real piece of shit. <laughs> Sorry, I was just having a flashback to a joke I wrote in 2018. That keeps happening. Isn't that weird how that keeps happening? <clears throat> As Screaming Man exhales a huge plume of raspberry and sauerkraut-flavoured vapour, <laughs> I reach into my pocket and I take out the 9-volt battery I got at the supermarket. I make a bit of a display of opening the package, take out the battery, hold it up to the light, give it a little sniff, <laughs> and then start furiously licking the end of it. <laughs> I wait till I can feel Screaming Man looking at me, and then I turn to him and I say, oh, 
I used to vape, but this is much healthier. <laughs> Screaming man looks confused. Mission accomplished. <laughs> I've actually been doing this little battery trick for a while now. And look, initially, it probably started out as like a passive aggressive political statement about the dangers of vaping, but now I'm addicted to licking nine volt batteries. <laughs> Can't stop, won't stop. <laughs> After a few more licks. <sighs> I pop the battery in my pocket <laughs> and I reach for the bag of mandarins. They're in one of those orange netting bags that they come in from the supermarket, and as I rip it open, I think of the ocean. Dead fish. <laughs> Cause and effect. <laughs> James Cameron! <laughs> Mandarins are the perfect palate cleanser for a nine-volt battery, by the way. <laughs> Their acidities just cancel each other out somehow, so... Anytime I'm licking bats, always got a couple of mandos on standby, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know what I'm saying. I take out two mandarins and I offer one to Screaming Man. Mandarin? <laughs> oh, yes please, he says, and he takes one. And at that moment, a young woman arrives and sits down on the bench between Screaming Man and me, and someone Somewhere wins an Academy Award for best casting in an independent short film. <laughs> she is perfect. 31, could play 28, lemon cardigan, cute bob, bangs, pink converse, houseplant tattoo, hoop skirt, starburst earrings, emotional support, guinea pig. <laughs> She's the kind of woman who has a guinea pig on a leash at the bus stop. Fuck yes! She got that Twitch stream and cosplay and cupcake bacon pronoun flippin' D and D on ketamine geek chic bubble tea thing going on. <laughs> I mentally run through my schedule for the next couple of months, decide I have nothing important happening, and instantly fall in love with this woman. <laughs> Damn you, Christmas horny! <laughs> oh, yes, please, she says, and she takes one. And there we sit. Three characters in an independent short film, <laughs> silently enjoying our mandarins <laughs> with a fucking guinea pig. Shot through the heart, and you're to blame, darling. You give love a bad name. The fact that Screaming Man's ringtone is Bon Jovi <laughs> totally tracks with his character. <laughs> the fact that he stands up and walks away to a respectful distance to answer the call does not track with his character at all. Because if this was an independent short film, he would answer the phone on the bench next to us, and his one-sided telephone conversation would do a lot of heavy lifting when it came to revealing later moments of the plot. <laughs> He'd be all like, no, I am not coming into work today, for I have a funeral to attend. 
And even if I get somehow swept up in the story of two unlikely strangers and a guinea pig, <laughs> you better damn well believe I will be attending that funeral right on sunset. But he doesn't. He gets up and fucks off. <laughs> and I'm starting to feel very disappointed until I notice the young woman is looking at me. I'm Phoebe. Of course you are. <laughs> Just as the word sizzle is onomatopoeic for the sound a sausage makes while frying in a fry pan, Phoebe is onomatopoeic for the sound a rabbit makes when it sees a butterfly. Fubble! <gasps> Phoebe is the sound of a baby duck sneezing. Fubble! Phoebe is the sound of a tadpole with the hiccups. <laughs> Phoebe is the sound of a fox's tail brushing past a Nintendo Switch. <laughs> Phoebe is the sound of the wind whistling through a crocheted bikini top drying on a Balinesian sunbed. <laughs> Phoebe is the sound of an acai berry smoothie through a paper straw. <laughs> Phoebe is the sound of the doorbell ringing at the house where you've nervously arranged the first threesome in your six-year monogamous relationship. Phoebe, 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 Phoebe. <laughs> Hello, Phoebe. My name's Randy. Hello, Randy. This, she says, holding up the guinea pig, is Simone de Beauvoir. <laughs> and I don't know whether to come or kill myself. <laughs> At that moment, the bus arrives. Screaming Man ends his telephone call and gets on first, followed by Phoebe and Simone de Beauvoir. <laughs> and then I board the bus and I hand the tin of shortbread biscuits to the bus driver and I take my seat. My parents were both school bus drivers, you see, and at the end of every school year, the children would often gift them tins of shortbread biscuits. So now, any time I catch a bus, I hand a tin of shortbread biscuits to the bus driver and I say, thank you for your service. <laughs> to distract from the fact that I have not purchased a ticket. <laughs> now, it's quite a full bus, but everybody has a seat. I'm sitting across the aisle from Screaming Man and I'm four rows back from Phoebe and I'm staring at the back of her head, wondering if our children will have ADHD. <laughs> and I start to think about how to turn this entire experience into a comedy routine. See, as a comedian, I've got to be looking for the funny in every situation all the time. I have to constantly mine my real life for comedic material, no matter how dark shit gets. Got to be fresh, got to be original. I can't come up here and do 58 minutes of fart jokes as much as I would love to. <laughs> it's got to be fresh and new and exciting stuff. The pressure is enormous! That's why I always carry a dick pic in my top pocket. Just to remind me that you're only ever as good as your last dick joke. <laughs> Not very good! Ha! <laughs> <laughs> the bus pulls over and a couple of passengers get off and a couple more get on. And I place the bag of mandarins onto my lap and I slide across in my seat to allow an elderly man to sit next to me. And as the bus pulls back out into traffic, I experience the most intense, instant, horrific pain in my right testicle. I have never felt anything like it. It is as if someone has taken a hot needle and they are pushing or lunging it suddenly or violently right into my ball sack. 
The wasps found the mandarins! <laughs> I start screaming, Wah! Wah! I throw the mandarins on the ground, I'm like, get them off me! Get them off me! I stand up on my seat and I shove my hand down the front of my pants <laughs> and the wasp stings me on the palm and I'm like, Wah! <laughs> and nobody is helping. <laughs> Screaming man looks at me and tells me to sit down and shut up. The old man next to me looks at me, gets up, moves to another seat. The bus driver's useless. He's eating fucking shortbread biscuits. And worst of all, Phoebe, love of my life, is looking back at me in horror, shielding Simone de Beauvoir's eyes from the spectacle. And as I stand there, with everybody judging me or ignoring me, but nobody asking me how they can help. As I scream in agony, repeatedly punching myself in the genitals. It occurs to me that this is the perfect analogy for American politics. <laughs> Which is why tonight, I am announcing that I am officially running for President of the United States of America in 2024. I'll call it a mission, I've made a decision. To break with tradition and bring a petition to this inquisition. It's a proposition, an admission of my position. And it began by Googling words that rhyme with vision. I was born to stand upon the stage. But times have changed and I began to disengage. Then Lady Luck delivered me into the TikTok age, where felt-faced pricks like me are all the fucking rage. My sacred works of art dissected into gimmicks. My special's far too existential to impress the cunts at Netflix. I'm chasing clicks, charging too much for ticks. I only got this gig tonight by sucking Jeff Dunham's dick. I think this is as low as my career can sink. I fear that mediocrity might be my kink. So I run a bath and make a plan to end it quick. And then a sweet solution hits me like a ton of bricks. I'll just switch my dick pic for a crucifix. Now I'm in politics. Vote one, Randy Feltface. Politics. There's a new horse in this race. Politics. And by horse, I mean centaur. I have the body politics. of a horse. That's why I hide behind this. It's true, the world has never been in such a fucking state. There are a list of leaders to assassinate. I'm not condoning it, but I would look away if you kill Peter Dutton. With great power comes great responsibility. And I intend to lead you with humility. And if I lose, then I will choose to refuse to accept the result. Fuck you, Melvin! Politics. How many politicians does it take to change a light bulb? Politics. Three. One to change it, one to say they could have done it better, Politics. and one to stick it up their ass for no apparent reason. Politics. I'm the third one. Politics. You need a leader who can be a people-pleasing puppet, Politics. and someone who sees a battery and has to suck it. Politics. You need me. Politics. I will be your president until I get bored. President Feltface, motherfuckers! Huh. All right. All right. Now, <clears throat> the first thing any brand new political party needs is its very own written constitution. And here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> oh, I know, a song and a prop. Wow. <laughs> mm. 
no expense spared for the people of Melbourne. <laughs> oh, man. I bought this prop this afternoon at the office works in Elizabeth Street. <laughs> First thing I'm going to do when I become president will be to shut down the office works on Elizabeth Street. <laughs> Can't spell customer service without uh! <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Feltopia party party objectives. Objective number one. To cultivate a deep understanding of the true purpose of existence. Free from the influence of capitalist ambition or the pursuit of short-term gratification at the expense of the natural world. Through the socially disruptive yet peaceful and non-violent undermining of irrelevant and greed-driven economic systems. With an emphasis on inclusivity and equality. Objective number two. Hand jobs. <laughs> and those are all of the objectives. <laughs> Just before we go on, I could tell a lot of you were thinking, hang on a minute, Randy, aren't you Australian? I thought you had to be Merkin if you want to be President of Merka. <laughs> well, I will have you know, my friends, some of my parts made in America. Loophole! <laughs> you know, comedians and politicians are very similar. We've both monetized transphobia. <laughs> we also dance with the distance between cause and effect. Comedians say things on stage that can have a lasting effect. I mean, you might be driving home tonight and you'll go, <laughs> Hand jobs. <laughs> and politicians are literally controlling the weather. And if you haven't personally experienced an extreme weather event yet, it's only a matter of time before it's your weird neighbour on the evening news being interviewed going, well, wow, my house was on fire and underwater at the same time. <laughs> but uh, I had to go back in for me dog. But despite the similarities, I always thought the leap from comedy to politics would be impossible. And then a Ukrainian improv comic <laughs> by the name of Vladimir Zelensky became one of the most charismatic wartime presidents in history. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't seem so far fetched for old Randy Fuckface now, does it? Huh? <clears throat> Zelensky quit comedy for politics, though, and he's a huge role model of mine. I'm a big fan of the Zelensk. <laughs> Which is why tonight, I am announcing that I am officially retiring from the comedy business. I'm done. Oh, well, I can't do both, can I? Imagine popping down the Palais on a Friday night to see the president do a tight ten. It'd fucking suck. You'd think it would be good, but it'd be the hackiest, most middle-of-the-road, people-pleasing comedy shit. Folks, don't you hate it when you're trying to get a bill passed through the Senate and you need to go poop? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only motion that needs passing around here is that third coffee I regret having this morning. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Filibuster. Fill a bucket more like it. <laughs> 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 Politics all the way, biddy! Until the inevitable assassination attempt thwarted by the dick pic in my top pocket. <laughs> whereupon I shall retire from politics and announce my long-awaited comedy comeback show! <laughs> ah, yes, we all love a comedy comeback show, don't we? Oh, I thought that he wasn't doing it anymore. <laughs> but then he's... And now he's, he's, he's back again. He's doing another one. This, this one's the same as all of the other ones. But there was a gap in the middle. 
That's, that's why this one's a comeback one. Comedians always come back. We're like wasps crawling out of tin cans. We just keep thrusting. Even if we get cancelled, there's always an audience, sometimes a bigger one. Thanks, Patreon. <laughs> but you know, I believe it was Winston Churchill who put it best when he said... <laughs> yeah, really makes you think, doesn't it? <laughs> Hello there, what's your name? Thomas. What is it? Thomas! Hello, Thomas! Hi. Did I get you on the first go? Yes. Fuck yes. <laughs> Thomas! Hi. What did you do today, Thomas? Uh, not much. Had a day off. You what? Had a day off. Thomas had a day off, everybody! <laughs> <laughs> Thereby proving that Thomas is not someone that I've planted in the audience <laughs> for very interesting back and forth crowd work. What did you do on your day off, Thomas? I uh, just hung out and I had a job interview. You had a job interview? Yeah. <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. What, uh, what job are you going for, Thomas? Uh, campaign officer with the Firefighters Union. Say again one more time. Campaign officer with the Firefighters Union. Campaign officer for the Firefighters Union. <laughs> yes. Now this is where I'm faced with the choice. Do I wish to endure the wrath of the firefighters' union for the remainder of my career? Or do I talk to Thomas about something else? Where do you live, Thomas? Yeah, very... Firefighters are big and muscly and they climb ladders and have hoses and shit. I shall not be taking them on this time. No, I shall not. Thomas, um, where do you live? Footscray. Footscray? Fuck yes! Come on, the doggies! <laughs> no, some football fans in the crowd. That uh, doesn't gel with my normal demographic, but that's cool. <laughs> hey, Thomas, yeah. um, tell me something else interesting that's more interesting than your job interview and Footscray. <laughs> Who did you come here with tonight, Thomas? Just by myself. Just by yourself? <laughs> Fuck yes! Come on now, come on, yes, yes, Thomas, we're all friends now. Do you have, you said you had a day off and you went for a job interview, what's your existing job? Uh, bartender. You're a bartender, where did you tend bar? Uh, Fortress Melbourne. Uh, where? Fortress. Fortress. Everybody knows about Fortress except for me. <laughs> Fortress sounds like some sort of Sex club. <laughs> Is it just a bar? Uh, bar and uh, land centre. Bar and what? Land centre, so like computers and gaming and stuff. Oh, it's a oh, it's a gaming place. <laughs> See, that's why my crowd cheered so much. <laughs> that checks out. More. Did you hear how that louder was? That that cheer was louder than the sports fans. <laughs> Fortress, yeah. Footy, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. So you were a bartender at a place where you go and play games and, and drink. Yeah. Oh, my God. And you're here on your own. Oh, my God, you must get laid so much. <laughs> um, Tumis. <laughs> Tumble. <laughs> Twimby twum twu. If I was the mayor of Footscray, What's the first thing you would want me to do in that area to make things more enjoyable? Oh, no. What? <laughs> uh, if you didn't hear it, he said hand jobs. <laughs> Already my number two policy. <laughs> Nothing else? Uh, there's a lot of uh, abandoned land plots at the moment that need clearing because it's. Pretty, pretty dangerous. Abandoned what? Abandoned land plots, so like, like old buildings that are crumbling. Fire. There's a lot of abandoned old buildings that need something done with them. Yeah. <gasps> are you thinking what I'm thinking? <laughs> More bars where you can play games? <laughs> More nerd bars? Oh my god, 
Okay, first thing I'm gonna do, hand job. Second thing I'm gonna do is gonna turn all of the abandoned buildings in Footscray into like nerd palaces. <laughs> yes, yes, people shall come from miles around on their own. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm sensing a little bit of skepticism in the room. I get it, you're all looking at me going, Randy, you raggedy old repurposed couch cushion. <laughs> How could you ever make it in politics? Let's be clear, people. I never wanted to go into politics. I am an artist. <laughs> I should be writing poetry and playing panpipes, getting fingered under a willow tree. <laughs> but politicians are doing such a shit job, it's up to the comedians to step in. We had to do it with the news. You think comedians enjoy working on satirical news programs? You think anyone on The Project or The Weekly like their job? <laughs> I've met those people and they are fucking miserable! <laughs> but the media were doing such a shit job, we had to step up. Comedians to the rescue yet again. And I know you're all looking at me going, that's all well and good, Randy, you bargain bin fuck rag. But are you even remotely qualified to enter politics? And I understand that question because you people don't know me for anything other than comedy. And that is because I've never had any other job. <laughs> Apart from one time in my early 20s, I got a job at a discount furniture warehouse. And I thought I was gonna be on the sales team, but turns out they just wanted me to stand out the front on the street and do this. I did it for eight years! <laughs> but you'll be glad to know that this was not an overnight decision. I've taken this decision very seriously, my friend. I want to be a palatable political candidate. I want to be someone the voting people can trust. Which is why tonight, I am very excited to unveil my full-scale political makeover! Thank you. First thing I did to clean up my reputation, I started wearing shoes. That's a big step up for me. Step up. <laughs> I also stopped going to therapy, started drinking again, and moved my poppy plantations offshore. But the biggest change, <laughs> the biggest change that I made to make myself someone who can relate to the general public, someone you can vote for, is um, <clears throat> for the past year, I have been involved in a monogamous, heterosexual relationship. <laughs> wow, okay, thanks. That is just enormous support from you. <laughs> Four people went, yay. <laughs> I get it, I understand, Melbourne. It, you know, it goes against my slutty pansexual image. <laughs> I know, I know it's not the Randy Felt face you've come to know and fuck, but look. Sometimes you just have to meet the right person at the right time. And I did, at a bus stop. Her name is Phoebe! <laughs> yes! And this is 100% true. We did meet at a bus stop. Her name is Phoebe. We caught the same bus. I was stung on the dick and balls by a thrusting wasp. And it was Phoebe who got off at the same stop as me and witnessed the fact that my scrotum was swelling to the size of a fucking volleyball. <laughs> and she was the one who called the Uber and actually came with me to the emergency room where, by the way, the triage nurse called me John Wayne because she said I was walking like I just got off a horse. You're reporting, but it's unprofessional in my opinion. 
Anyway, Phoebe and I exchanged numbers, and three weeks later, once my genitals had returned to their shrunken pre-wasp glory, <laughs> Phoebe and I went on the best first date ever. We met at a park right near Phoebe's house, and yes, I admit, I was cynical when she turned up with Simone de Beauvoir. <laughs> but we just hit it off. We didn't do anything or go anywhere. She brought cupcakes, because of course she did. <laughs> and we just sat under a tree for five hours, laughing our asses off. And I'd never felt more myself that quickly around someone before. And I was like, oh, shit. I think this is what people talk about when they talk about finding their person. <laughs> Fucking terrifying. Anyway, um, <laughs> it started to get a little bit late in the day, and um, we decided to keep hanging out and go and get some dinner. Now, Phoebe had arrived on foot. I was in the Saab, obviously. <laughs> so she handed me Simone de Beauvoir, and she went over to use the public toilet, and I skipped back to the car. I put the top down, and I drove the car across the car park to meet Phoebe when she came out of the toilets so she wouldn't have as far to walk. I know. Gross. <laughs> and we've been inseparable ever since. Turns out Phoebe is the sound of my heart exploding. Which is great for me, because now I get to do jokes about being in a relationship. I'm a real comedian. Come on! Yes! Yes! So, uh... <laughs> so I'm talking to the fellas here. The fellas know what I'm talking about. I know the fellas know what I'm talking about, don't you, fellas? Boys! You know when you and your girlfriend are doing that cute little thing that you do? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, fellas? That cute little thing that you and your girlfriend do? Where you lay at opposite sides of the bed in stony silence with your backs turned to each other? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, and she's trying to hide the fact that she's crying. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and you're rolling your eyes so far up in your head, you can see your own fucking brain. You know what I mean? Uh, and you think to yourself, we should have a kid. But look, I don't want to undersell it. Me and Phoebe, very much in love. And yes, the sex is fantastic. <laughs> and look, I wouldn't bring it up, but on this whole tour, people keep asking me what I'm into in the bedroom. More people than should, if I'm being honest. <laughs> so just to clear it up for all of you curious cats out there, um, I am a sub. <laughs> yeah. I mean, clearly, he is the dom. Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> so there you have it, my friends. I am a boring man in a committed relationship with conservative opinions and a hint of sexual deviancy. I am your new president! <clears throat> the first thing I'm going to do is make it illegal for anyone over the age of 50 to own more than one property. You property-hoarding, negative-gearing, land-barren fucks! <laughs> also, anyone who is currently staying in an Airbnb, it's yours now.
you own it. Live, laugh, love. It's the law now. <laughs> and I know I'll get slammed in the Murdoch press for this. I'll be dragged through the mud on talkback radio. I'm going to get cancelled by the boomers! <clears throat> Sorry, I know that in the current climate, any time a comedian on stage says the word cancelled or cancel culture, you, as an audience, collectively vomit into your mouth, swallow the vomit, vomit it back up, catch the vomit, eat the vomit, shit it out, grab the shit and rub the shit on your face. <laughs> I'm exactly the same. <laughs> but it does not mean that I am not terrified of being cancelled. So tonight, I thought I'd get out in front of this shit and reveal some of my ugliest truths to you all this evening and cancel myself before anyone else can! I masturbate while driving. <laughs> I think any dogs under 10 kilograms should be bred out of existence. <laughs> Sydney is better than Melbourne. I deliberately misgender babies. <laughs> Within the first minute of this show, I referred to Jesus Christ as a cunt. That happened. Now, oh, look, hey, look, I'm not here to shit on anybody's faith systems, OK? Dig what you want to dig, baby. But you've got to understand, I was raised Catholic, so in my opinion, jokes about Jesus are fucking hilarious! <laughs> oh, look, have I said one or two things in my career that could be perceived as regrettable? Possibly. But in my defence, I am battling a serious 9-volt battery addiction at this time. <laughs> I'm trying to detox on double A's, but it's hard! I went to an AA meeting, but it wasn't about batteries! <laughs> and finally, and this is the big one, Phoebe and I are not together anymore. I mean... <laughs> Technically, we didn't make it past the first date. It was the best first date ever. All of that was true. We had an amazing day in the park, and it started to get late. We decided to go get dinner. So she handed me Simone de Beauvoir. She went to use the public toilets. I skipped back to the car, put the top down, backed the car up, and it turns out Phoebe is the sound a guinea pig makes when you back over it with the 2000 model 93-esque. <laughs> Con convertible Saab. <laughs> it wasn't dead, but it was pretty fucked up. <laughs> it, it's, its back was broken and its, its leg was all... <laughs> it was suffering. It was suffering. And I'm like... Well, there's no way I can get out of this. There are no other cars in the car park. Clearly, I have run over the guinea pig. So I have a choice. Do I let Phoebe come out of the toilets and see her beloved pet guinea pig in this much pain? Or... <laughs> Do I kill the guinea pig? <laughs> Tough call as a vegan. I mean, I can't take an animal's life, but I can't let an animal suffer. <sighs> I gotta kill the guinea pig! <sighs> <sighs> so, I picked up a rock, <laughs> and I knelt down next to Simone de Beauvoir.
I'm so sorry. <laughs> if I hadn't have locked my keys in the car three weeks ago, you wouldn't be in this position. The distance between cause and effect. <laughs> And Simone de Beauvoir went limp. And I imagined her little soul rising up out of her body. And I followed the path of her soul up into the air. And locked eyes with Phoebe. <laughs> just witnessed me murder her guinea pig in cold blood. I mean, who brings a guinea pig to a first date? Seriously. Who brings cupcakes to a first date? Cupcakes with blue icing, by the way. Blue is not even a natural colour for foodstuffs. Name me one blue food. Purple! Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was just having a flashback to a joke I wrote in 2013. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know that joke, actually? If you're not familiar with that joke, that blueberries bit, it's one of my most well-known jokes. People quote that joke at me all the time. People make fucking fan art for that joke. <laughs> the original premise was, what flavour are blue 7-Eleven slushies? And then that turned into a bit about food allergies, Anyway, the punchline was always, blueberries are fucking purple. Now, I filmed that joke for a special, and after it had been online for a few years, somebody pointed out to me that it is very similar to a joke by one of the greatest comedians of all time, George Carlin. And by very similar, I mean almost identical. George Carlin's bit is about blue foods, and he actually uses the words, blueberries are purple. Now, when I wrote the joke, I knew who George Carlin was, sure, but I'd never seen that bit. I hadn't seen much of his stuff, actually. I was more of a Bill Hicks fan at that point in my life. Yeah, if you're not familiar, if Carlin's the Torah, Hicks is the New Testament. But I can say, <laughs> with absolute confidence that if I had seen the George Carlin blue foods bit, there's no fucking way I would have written that joke. That's not how I roll, Melbourne. And look, it's not a particularly original premise. Blueberries are fucking papa! <laughs> but the fact is, George Carlin filmed that joke in front of a live audience two years before I was even born. <laughs> Can you feel that, Melvin? <laughs> this is the real cancellation. You've all totally forgotten that two minutes ago, I caved in a guinea pig's head with a fucking rock. <laughs> Look, the greatest crime in comedy is lack of originality. But in politics, lack of originality is a fucking asset. So maybe I'm entering politics not because I actually want to see change in the world, but because I'm not certain I have anything original left to contribute. I don't want to become a Randy Feltface cover band churning out another hour of jokes, barely distinguishable from the last hour of jokes, year after year after year, having flashbacks to jokes I've already written while I'm on stage, or second-guessing every single comedic premise for fear of plagiarism. To be perfectly honest, I don't even know if I know how to be funny anymore. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> oh. Oh, Jesus. <sighs> so anyway, after I 
euthanized Simone de Beauvoir. <laughs> Phoebe was understandably inconsolable. I managed to clumsily explain that it was an act of mercy rather than straight up guinea pig homicide, and she calmed down long enough to stop punching me in the face. <laughs> Which was nice. I emptied a tin of shortbread biscuits that I had stashed in the Saab, and Phoebe scooped up Simone de Beauvoir's lifeless body and placed it in the tin. Phoebe said this was Simone de Beauvoir's favourite park, and it seemed a fitting place to bury her. I was pretty sure that would have been against council regulations, but I think she was in shock, so I didn't say anything. <laughs> There was a circular rose garden in the middle of the park with soil loose enough for me to dig a hole with a stick, and we placed the tin into the hole, covered it with dirt, and stepped back. As Phoebe began to shakily sing Candle in the Wind by Elton John, <laughs> it occurred to me that Maybe I dodged a bullet ending the relationship before it started. <laughs> and look, that might sound harsh, but let's put this into perspective, shall we? I have nothing to offer someone like Phoebe. I'm never around, man. I've been on the road for so much of my adult life that the only meaningful relationships I've managed to cultivate are with the people that work in the Virgin Lounge at Cool and Gatter Airport. <laughs> Tracy sends hugs, by the way. And I know you wanted it to work out with me and Phoebe. I know you were invested in my happiness because I heard you all go, ah, oh, during the Phoebe story. And I appreciate that. I love that. It means a lot to me. I respect you as an audience. And that's why I've got to be honest with you and tell you that if I was in a committed relationship, I probably wouldn't tell you people about it. <laughs> it's none of your fucking business. Phoebe is the sound of my heart exploding. Get fucked, Melvin! <laughs> the sun began to set as Phoebe moved on to Green Day's Time of Your Life. And I glanced over to my right, and there, Leaning against a tree with the sun setting behind him was Screaming Man <laughs> licking a nine volt battery. <laughs> and the credits began to roll on this independent short film. I had a vision that I could turn myself into a politician That I could listen to reason and end this division By being commander-in-chief But I would need a lobotomy And honestly, if up to me, I'd fuck the economy And I quite like sodomy So I'm quitting politics and I'm sticking with comedy Come on! <laughs> this is my comedy comeback show Featuring 20% more hand job jokes. So follow me on TikTok and buy some merch before you go. Cause this is now my comedy comeback show. The Feltopia party belongs to the people now. You have the power. You make the choices. You figure out how to make your own fucking nerd bars in Footscray. And if anybody needs me, I'll be memorizing my thrusting techniques. <laughs> this is my comedy comeback show. Oh, in a minute, I'll be backstage doing massive lines of blow. I killed a guinea pig with my bare hands and somehow I have not been cancelled. That's why I'm doing a comeback show. Thank you so much, Melvin. Good night.